Hello everyone, this is Ezekiel Callahan with After Chatter. Now there were a lot of different articles out this month, likely due to all the people submitting their masters and doctorate theses. So without any further ado, let's look at May in review. First, we're going to look at Ichthyornis, which was somewhere between our modern birds and the non-avian dinosaurs on an evolutionary scale, as it had the beginnings of a beak, but also still had teeth as shown in four very well-preserved specimens which were described at the beginning of the month. The specimens help to show the evolution of birds, as the brain and the brain cases of Ichthyornis were shown to be much more bird-like, with highly developed, sophisticated functions for using the beak very dexterously. However, it still had the musculature of a traditional non-avian dinosaur, showing the evolutionary pathways that life took in order to give us our modern day birds. Moving on, we're gonna look at something smaller, the gastropods, snails and slugs, which evidence from Romania has shown they made a very quick recovery relative to other species after the end Permian extinction, helping to show that the bottom dwelling life of the ancient seas recovered faster from the extinction than mid ocean level life, such as reefs. Moving to the ancient oceans of present day Mali, Two prehistoric species of sea snake were found from the period immediately following the KPG extinction, helping us to understand just how life responded and rebounded after that extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. Many people know of giant ground sloths, especially ones that have been portrayed in popular media, such as Sid from Ice Age. However, fewer know about the aquatic sloths, that is, a branch of the sloths which broke off and became adapted for a life at sea. A study of their bones showed how these sea sloths became more and more adapted for life in the water. Specifically, how their bones became denser and denser over time to act kind of like a modern day diver's belt, however internalized in the skeleton, which is something we see the same function in in whales, which evolved in a similar pattern, getting denser bones to help their buoyancy in the water. And it's also how we know the light bone dinosaurs didn't live in the water. The Actinotigarian fish is a group today mostly known as the ray finned fish, which comprises 99% of all fish species today, and mathematically is the most numerous vertebrate in the world as far as the number of species included. However, their origins have been somewhat unknown up until a recent discovery of a very early in Devonian ray-finned fish showed parts of their evolution, most notably a brain case to help show how the ray-finned fish separated from the lobe-finned fish, which gave rise to tetrapods as we know them today. Myasauri is one of the most important species we have for understanding how such small original baby dinosaurs grew into such massive behemoths. However, Many of the smaller, younger specimens had not been specifically described and instead only specifically compared to the adults in order to help understand the growth of Myasaura as a whole. This month, a study was published on the smaller Myasaura, helping us understand just how the dinosaurs grew during their younger growth periods, rather than focusing on the growth period as a whole. Sometimes the sciences move slowly. As an example, the study and presentation of fossilized footprints hasn't changed very much since 1858, when Edward Hitchcock presented this drawing to his peers. While the upgrade from basic drawings to modern high-definition photography has been great, the authors suggest an entire array of 3D modeling techniques in order to ensure the maximum amount of data is gained from every footprint. This also helps to ensure that future generations have more data to use particularly in the case that any fossil footprint is destroyed, such as been in the case recently in Utah and Australia. A large group of scientists looking for the origin of feathers found a major clue inside some of our better preserved fossilized dinosaurs which show feathers, and that is specifically they found dinosaur dandruff. Pieces of dinosaur skin, potentially only a few micrometers thick, was found in and amongst the feathers and shows no contamination as parts of it are covered by the original matrix rock, meaning nothing was accidentally spilled onto these feathers. Specifically, the skin and its development shows a combination of reasons for why feathers evolved. 
most notably a higher metabolism, which is why many of the flight feathers we find on dinosaurs seem to be from small species, such as Microraptor. And this helps us to understand exactly how the dinosaurs were able to evolve their flight and turn into the modern birds we know today. The Aves, modern birds, were the only dinosaur group to survive the KPG mass extinction. And there's been a lot of questions as to why exactly that was. There were already many birds, such as Confucianorus from the earlier Cretaceous, which had evolved flight and seemed to be quite adept at it. The birds that seem to have survived the extinction seem to have all been ground-based, meaning specifically what happened is that when the meteor struck and the forests burned down, the species that survived didn't need the trees, as they were largely ground-based, such as the branches that became the modern-day chickens and ostriches. And from there, the rest of the birds we have, from the smallest sparrow to the largest eagle, all came from these small, ground-based species. Our oldest squaw model fossil, that is, fossils of modern-day lizards and snakes, comes from the Middle Jurassic. However, genetic testing in order to try and differentiate how quickly the species split apart and evolved suggests a much earlier start date. A study published this month used x-rays to look at a 20-year-old fossil, finding that the species Megatrella actually belongs inside Squamata, as opposed to just being a close relative or ancestor of it, as was previously believed based on the condition of the fossil. This pushes the start date of the Squamates back to 240 million years, to the early or mid-Triassic, much more in line with what genetic data has shown us. This helps to show the importance of using cross-application of different fields, such as genetics, to understand how evolution works and just how important it is to understanding our fossil record. Scientists this past month published a study on the smallest, largest theropod known. That is, Spinosaurus, the largest theropod, but the smallest one known of them. A few bones and a claw have been attributed to Spinosaurus, coming from the Kemkem -Kem beds of Morocco. This would be the smallest Spinosaurus on record, being perhaps only six to eight feet long, about as large as a person, if not a little bit bigger, which is a stark contrast to the massive giants they became, approaching potentially 50 feet long in the adults. The largest species of fish alive today is the cartilaginous whale shark. At about 40 feet long, it cruises along eating plankton and isn't much of a threat to just about anything. Most species today, such as the whale shark, only cruise along at a few miles per hour. This bony fish, which was much larger than the whale shark, seems to have been able to swim at 17 kilometers per hour. And for comparison, the fastest fish today, such as the mako shark or some sailfish, maybe max out at about 30 kilometers per hour. Meaning that these ancient bony fish were not only massive, approaching 50 feet, but also very quick for their size. Something notable in understanding just why they did not evolve again, as the largest plankton-eating bony fish today would be some of the sunfish, which are very harmless and rather dull. Like, it's something they're known for, that they are dull. This has left some evolutionary scientists in a predicament, as biomechanically speaking, the species should still work today as fast-moving, plankton-feeding, very large fish. However, they haven't re-evolved, meaning that some evolutionary pressure was put on them to stop them from evolving. These large, plankton-eating fish were potentially overshadowed and outcompeted by the whales, which have now taken that place as large, plankton-eating vertebrates. Finally, moving on towards extinctions, as it is one of my main focuses on this channel, we're going to be looking at a study of fish from the KPG extinction, which indicates that after the initial cooling period of the meteor impact, there was a long period of global warming for nearly 100,000 years, meaning any effect from the cooling that happened was also tempered and slowed recovery by this longer term global warming. Which means again, just to be clear, Global warming is bad. Hello well, everyone, thanks for watching. I do appreciate you guys for continually watching the channel. I am going to be streaming on Twitch the new Jurassic World game that's coming out, Jurassic World Evolution, so I'll put a link to that down below. Watch it or don't, it's 
not a major thing. I'm doing it more for fun. You shouldn't expect any of that on the channel. I am going to be purely scientific on the channel. I am going to be trying to catch Jurassic World when it comes out so I can talk about some of the science and the species that are in that movie. However, I'm not in England, so I don't catch it on release date, so I apologize if some of the information seems a little bit delayed. And so from there, be sure to follow me on Twitter for more updates and for just general scientific information. And that is at raptor underscore chatter on Twitter. And so finally, be safe, take care, don't go extinct.